Have you ever been browsing one platform looking for a certain product and end up seeing related ads on an entirely different platform later that day? Behind the scenes, you just became a victim of the infamous tracking pixel, which is among the many ways companies are pushing the limits on the technology used to track how you browse the web. The old reliable tracking pixel takes things a step further by making its way into your inbox, serving as an over-engineered red receipt to analyze and harvest your data. All of their power crumbles with the slightest amount of technical know-how, as they are notoriously easy to detect and counteract. In this video, we're going to be applying the underlying mechanics of tracking pixels to legitimate resources, essentially hiding them in plain sight, removing suspicion, and making them truly untraceable. The best part? Anyone can do this, including you. Let's get started. To understand how tracking pixels work, we need to first understand how computers communicate. Hypertext Transport Protocol HTTP is the most widely used protocol that uses requests and responses as a bread and butter for communication. A client device starts by sending an HTTP request asking for whatever image or website you're seeking. The server then sends back an HTTP response with the contents. Pretty simple, and it turns out this is how the entire web works. Most of the time, the requests are going to take the form of a GET request. Every time you see information on the web, such as when we go to Google and search for an image, our computer is going to ask for it by sending out a GET request, and the server is going to respond with a response so that we can see the image. Contained within the GET request is the address that is used to locate where the image is being hosted, which is why we can see the image when we put this into our URL bar. Now you might be asking yourself what this has to do with tracking pixels. The answer is everything. Tracking pixels usually take the form of a 1x1 transparent image that is hosted on a server. Anytime a client makes a GET request to that image, it is now aware that the client sent off the request. If you place a tracking pixel inside of an email, as soon as you open the email, a GET request will be sent to the server hosting it, essentially making it a virtual tripwire. As mentioned before, traditional tracking pixels are intended to be entirely hidden from the user, but they can be easily discoverable by anyone with even the slightest bit of dedication. You can check for hidden images, scan network traffic, or just use auto detectors and blockers. Due to how easy they are to spot, would you really want to be caught sending a tracking pixel to a professor or employer? This is where my idea comes in, hiding a tracking pixel in plain sight. Now that we know tracking pixels are nothing special, why not use a regular image instead? Especially one that can always be included as to never arouse suspicion, such as one a part of an email signature. What's stopping us from building this ourselves? We're going to encounter three main roadblocks on this grind, but if we can get around them, we can build an essentially untraceable tracking pixel, so we can know in real time when we're getting ghosted. The image needs to be hosted on a web server that we own, or at least have full access to. If you just take any random image posted online, the GET request will be sent to whatever random server is hosting it instead, and we won't have any way of tracking the request. We can essentially host this anywhere, such as our own web server like a Raspberry Pi, one of the many cloud providers, or we can even host it on our PC as a dev server if you just want to experiment. Regardless of where you host it, the outcomes will be the same. Once we have the image hosted, we need to be careful with how we reference the image in the email. Remember that the recipient opening the email should trigger a GET request. If we just attach the image locally, Gmail will add the underlying data of the image to the body of the email itself, meaning that this will not trigger a GET request. Even if we use the link to the hosted image directly, Gmail will immediately cache this with one of their caching bots, called Google Image Proxy, making this the new image endpoint, meaning our server still won't receive the GET request when the email is opened. We need to be creative and find a way to insert a direct reference to our web server that will persist up until the point that the email gets opened. One way is to use an image tag within HTML so that the browser needs to ask for the image when the HTML gets rendered. This is the same way that images are normally sourced on the internet. Every image you see online is given to us with an image tag with a reference to the endpoint. We need to be smart about this though, because if we just decide to use raw HTML, Gmail will not render this. Of course we could write software such as a browser extension that automatically injects it for us, but an easy way is to save the HTML as a .html file, open it in your browser, and copy and paste it into the email. This way, the HTML gets rendered properly on the receiving end, and the GET request will be triggered. Lastly, on our web server, we now need to write some code where we process the GET request and host the image on a public URL. Also, what if you wanted to use the same image in our email signature over and over again? We need a way to distinguish which GET request corresponds to which email, and we certainly don't want to get into this type of nightmare. There's many different ways that we can approach this, but in this video, let's use a dynamic web framework to tag each URL with some sort of universal identifier or UID. Within Django, let's define a single URL pattern that has a UID parameter that can be used to keep track of which link was used with each email. 
Let's also create a parameter named image so that this can be used with multiple different images so we're not locked into using the same image over and over again. Regardless of what's plugged into the URL, it will now match this URL pattern and the request will be dispatched to the same handling function which will now have access to these variables. This function will be ran every time someone sends a get request to the URL. Let's go ahead and print out our arguments, as well as the timestamp, so we can see what's going on when we make a request. To return the actual image in response to a request, we can open whichever image was included in the URL, send this back as the HTTP response body, and make sure it is of type image slash PNG. When we request the image, we can see this as output from our server. The cool thing is that this will now work with any UID and image, as long as we have an image with the same name saved in our server's file system. Now that we have this done, let's go ahead and prepare an instance of this URL into a .html file, open up in our browser, copy and paste it into our email, and send. Let's keep an eye on our terminal as we open the email. As we can now see, we know exactly when the recipient opened our email. If you look at our browser traffic when we open the email, we can see that the get request is being sent from my browser to Google user content, not to our server as you might expect. This is because Gmail has a server relay the request to our server. This does not actually affect the integrity of the tracking pixel, but it is something interesting to note. They also add cache control headers to the response, meaning that we might not see subsequent requests depending on the recipient's device, browser, and configurations. Well that was a grind. Now we have this fully functional tracking pixel that is essentially untraceable, as there's no tracking pixel to be found. If you liked this video and you want to see all of the ways that we can expand upon this, such as SMS alerts, programmatic injection of the footer, or auto mappings of UIDs to emails, let me know in the comments and subscribe for more content. Thanks for watching.